Okay, so early start to the day today. It's uh, just about 7 a.m. I'm taking the train here from my local station down to Vicenza and then on to Milan, uh, where I'm gonna go and pick up uh, something cool, something Italian, something with 500 plus horsepower. So it should be a fun day despite this miserable weather. And after that, I go meet Larry and his guys and we start doing cool stuff together. Centrale, super gigantic train station here in the heart of Milan. I'm gonna grab a taxi and head to the Stellantis headquarters. Uh, I was thinking of using the uh, subway, but with this suitcase, I really cannot be bothered to do that. So hopefully I can find a taxi quickly enough. So I'm here at Stellantis in Milano and I gotta find where I'm supposed to go and pick up this car. So I'll probably start at the dealership over there. All right, it looks like I found the right place. They're grabbing the car now. And while I'm here, check out this little Citroen. It's the same car that, um, well, same base as the Fiat Topolino. These are renowned for tipping over, strangely enough. So I think my car is just being brought out here. Alright, there it is. So Alpha has actually pulled an incredible feat finding me a car in two days. So I gotta say massive thank you to Marco and all his crew here at Alfa Romeo for hooking me up with the Stelvio Quadrifoglio. So uh, I'm just gonna jump in and get going. Okay, so the actual really cool thing about this particular Stelvio is of course that it is the Quadrifoglio version, so it runs the same 2.9 V6 uh, twin turbo engine as the Giulia Quadrifoglio, so 520, 530 horsepower. So it's a 500 horsepower SUV, performance SUV. And this particular car is actually celebrating the 100 years of the Quadrifoglio brand. So you can see here, the first car to wear the Quadrifoglio was uh, made in 1923, special car, and kind of glad to see that it runs Alpine Michelin tires because we're actually expecting stone in the next few days. So uh, peace of mind to have something like that fitted to this massive press car here. Right, let's get in, get comfortable. And I'm just gonna get going. Uh, Larry's just landed, he's picked up a Maserati. So uh, we're gonna have a nice combo of cars to travel around Italy with. And I'll start by muting the audio here. So I'm gonna get going and hopefully I can figure out how to get the navigation to work. I'm actually really settling into this Stelvio. It's so comfortable, it's so smooth. And uh, V6 up front is just effortless. It's ma made it to a eight-speed uh, automatic transmission which just uh, is just set to the normal setting and it's just so nice to drive especially with these kind of conditions but I'm about 40 minutes away from our Airbnb and hopefully we can get there at the same time as Larry's getting there okay looks like I got here a little bit uh, before Larry and the others so I'm gonna just pull in to our little house for the week Okay, not a bad place and definitely not a bad car to pull up with. Um, I have to say, I'm really impressed with this uh, Stelvio. I probably drove it for about 35 minutes and it is the most comfortable car uh, unless you go to like, you know, the sport mode and you kind of wake it up and you get that um, V6 to come to life. But it's like super comfortable uh, daily driver. 
a nice driving position you're sitting quite tall so you get a nice get nice visibility out the front this does not have the carbon ceramic package uh, like i mentioned before it's actually on uh, studless tires which really helps for the conditions that we're going to have this week and it also has the optional akrapovic exhaust unfortunately i have yet to hear it because i was driving very slow it's all 50 kilometer an hour speed limits around here but um, i'm sure we'll wake it up once we get to decent roads during our travels so uh, i guess i just wait for larry to show up all right here comes larry <laughs> You literally has the Maserati version of the Alpha. Oh you literally have the Maserati version of that. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. And an MG. It's like uh, we're doing SUV, SUV speed hunting here. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So we took the Stelvio Quadrifoglio to the Alfa Romeo Museum and Larry brought the Maserati Trofeo. What is this called again? Gracciale. Gricciale. So basically, uh, it's kind of the same car, same platform, same engine, except this has 560 horsepower. So it's actually uh, like the most perfect two cars to be comparing, right? Like this is like a, the best test drive ever. We didn't uh, plan. We didn't this even at plan all. it. Yeah. I, I didn't plan this for sure. I definitely. Because I asked Alfa Romeo for a Quadrifoglio, so I thought they would give me a Giulia, but then they gave me this, and I'm kind of happy. So, so then I asked them. Well, I didn't ask them anything. I assumed that they were going to get me something like this. Yeah. But they're like, oh, we were going to get you a Quattro Forte. Yeah. Right? A sedan. A sedan. So I'm like, all right, that's fine. Then, then because I was saying that I thought they were going to give me this, they ended up giving me this. <laughs> Which is not bad. You said it got 560 horsepower, right? Yeah. Yeah, there it goes. It sounds really angry, but I'm actually curious to see how different it sounds versus your car. Yeah, because I have a Krapovich, yeah. yeah. So I was looking this up. This has uh, a 5,000 euro option, a Krapovich exhaust. So how do you say this? Stelvio. It's Stelvio. a famous, Stelvio, it's a famous mountain pass. And then how do you say this? Greciale. Greciale. Greciale Trofeo. Greciale Trofeo. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. Teaching people how to pronounce Italian Maserati. words. Maserati, <laughs> Grecia, Greciale. Here before? No, it's the first time. <laughs> we get to experience it for the first time together. Amazing. You can you can get my Italian expressions yeah. coming through, but yeah, what a cool walkway, connecting the car park, Museo Storico, and we go to Alfa Romeo Cafe, which yeah. is this way. So yeah, we need to eat, and these guys just landed, so they need coffees. Oh, it's cold. Accreditation desk. Oh, nice. As soon as we come in, a nice Giulia Quadrifoglio. This is the Tonale. This is the smaller SUV that um, actually I've started seeing a lot of these in Japan. They're doing pretty well. For people that want comfortable city SUVs that are designed with a little bit more cuore sportivo, sporty heart, as they say. Oh, what? oh look at that down there. Oh, oh dude. Favorite. Oh, my God. My oh, dude. They're all, oh, no way. Oh, man. All right, first we eat. Oh, that's the engine. This is the engine in my, uh, in my Stelvia. Well, mine for a week. 90 degree V6. Twin turbo. Oh, there's a Alfa Romeo 4C front end hanging on the wall. So we got to the cafe here. Very fashionable. Look at the seating arrangement here. This is sick. All right, we're going to get some grub and then meet with the guys from the museum. Uh, hopefully we get a guide to take us around so we can actually, you know, ask questions and learn something. Good food, this is, good museum. This is the overall Italy vlog. Everything that doesn't make it into our coverage makes it. Into yeah, we're going to turn this into like a food show. Okay, so uh, with lunch taken care of, we're going to start the tour here. And we just came in to the main museum entrance. And there's Emmanuel Fanjo's old F1 car here. And this is basically the Monza collection, cars that are raced at Monza, including the last Ferrari, uh, the last Alfa Romeo um, Formula One car that was raced last year. So uh, nice little opening to the museum. This is the part that is open to the public. And over here, Super Turismo 156. 156 looks so good when it's decked out like this. These cars are super popular in Japan. 
as you probably gather from my coverage of that side of Japan car culture. I love the upturned exhausts there. This is pretty cool. You can see the progression of the Alfa Romeo badge, Croce Bichone, from 1910 on to 1919. 1925, it had the gold outside because of the world champion. And then 45. And you can see how Alfa Romeo was also involved in some other stuff that wasn't really <laughs> car related, including a seven cylinder airplane engine, radial 12,000 cc, kicking out 220 horsepower at 2000 RPM. That's pretty wild. Straight six, air cooled, 8.5 liter aviation motor. Incredible, it's massive. Kicking out 130 horsepower, but an insane amount of torque, obviously. 1911. I had no idea the history of Alfa Romeo went that deep, and it really, it really went even deeper than that. I mean, so many radial engines here. Look at this thing, 1937. This is a, almost a 50 liter monster of a thing. 1,350 horsepower at 2,400 RPM. Look at the exhaust setup, that's insane. All handmade. Three prope propellers, that's absolutely wild. So they're stacked, how many are there? 18 cylinders, nine cylinders for this, and this one too. And of course, even boats. We're gonna keep going here. So much to see, and I just got like sidetracked looking at aviation engines. Too much fun though. Man, this is sick. This is so nice. Look at the uh, architecture of this place. Very dramatic. And so the cars start all the way back to 1911. Alpha has been around a very long time. Look at this four-seater, individual seats. All geared towards sporty driving, of course. That's what Alfa Romeo has always been kind of known for, right? Having that driver's kind of feel about them. Look at this one, it has two Alfa Romeo emblems, just in case you see one from this side. <laughs> and one from that side. 1925 RL Super Sport. And we get onto the six Cs. What a beauty, in white too. Can you imagine having driven a car like this in 1931? And from the 6C we go to the 8C. Of course this is a straight eight motor, three headlights. Imagine that coming up behind you in 1932. Massive long bonnet onto the coupes, the 6C 2300 and the 6C 2500. Onto the two 1900s here and the Giulietta, the first Giulietta from 1955. Look at these lines, absolutely insane. The 2600 Sprint, 1962, very, very big car. And then the really legendary models that people could actually afford and get, like the Giulia four door in 1962. 1 1.6 liter, famous for being used uh, by the Italian Polizia, so the police car police car choice uh, in the 60s and 70s. This is another of my favorite, the Montreal, the tiny little V8 motor, only 2.6 liters of displacement and one of the nicest Gandini designs, to me at least. This is Bertone, badged of course, and that orange color is to die for. This is a boxer engine from the Alpha Sud, 1.2 liters. You see how compact that is. It's not the Hachiroku, the new ZN6 and later GR86 that came up with this front engine boxer design. And if you look here, much like Subarus, it has a transaxle at the front. So onboard disc brakes and everything is nicely contained in a very uh, well distributed package. Okay, so as we move over to the 1980s corner, these are two very special cars for me because I pretty much learned to drive in an Alpha 75 and then my dad had this uh, here in Italy while we would be commuting. So every time I came back to Italy from the UK, we would drive the 164 Twin Spark 2 liter. This is actually uh, the V6 engine that went into the 164. We never had this, but we had the Twin Spark. And I have fond memories of this car because it literally scared me to death many times. It had insane torques there and it went sideways. They're pretty much the faintest a uh, sign of rain on the road, very slippery. Uh, it would just throw the car sideways, which is great, because I learned a lot from uh, throwing this big Pininfarina designed 
four-door sedan. The 75 is very special because of course it had a transaxle and much like the Alpha Sud engine layout, it had onboard, inboard brakes at the back rather. And then of course, after the 164, we progressed into the 156. Of course, the 155 is missing. There should be a 155 here. And then the crazy one, the 8C Competizione from 2007. What a beauty. So this actually is the concept car that was made in 2004 to present the 8C, the production car that came out in 2007. What do you think, Larry? Beautiful, right? This is really cool. I see, I didn't even know they made this because we never got these in the US. That's crazy. There's a few in Japan that still pop up at like Daikoku meets and stuff. Beautiful looking car and possibly very valuable. All right, we're gonna move down. Just look at the design of this place. Absolutely amazing. We get down to slightly more special cars here. Starting with the 1952 Disco Volante, the C52. This is a touring coachwork body and possibly the most iconic Alfa Romeo ever made. This is absolutely nothing short of a work of art. I mean, what can you say about a car like this? It's just incredible. So you can see there the touring Superleggera logo in the back and that kind of flat UFO style design. Of course, Disco Volante in Italian means UFO and you can kind of see exactly why I got that nickname. It still has that iconic Alfa Romeo grill, but wow, look at the two-piece hood on the center there. From touring design of the Disco Volante, we move into the 1954-2000 Sportiva and this is a Bertone design. And this is my first time seeing this car. I'm blown away. Look at these shapes. I mean, cars 70 years ago just were so different from one another. You know, everything is so similar in today's kind of automotive choices that we have, but uh, these cars are just work of arts. Every time they came up with something, it would be something so unique, as does this, the Castagna, the Conquer. This is kind of like an aerodynamic study. This is made 110 years ago in 1913. And it is a bizarre looking thing. And one of the first studies in aerodynamics, I guess. It's a car that you know people still look at today for inspiration. A 1968 Carabo, another Bertone Gandini special, defining what the wedge shape should all be about. And as me and Larry were just looking at here, the back is just louvers everywhere. You got the rear section here, all louvered up, even the quarter panel and I do love this rear section here kind of like a blunt cut gold grid that kind of mask the tail lights and of course that super pointy front end and then we move over to the Alfa Romeo Iguana this is a Zagato Ital design creation really funky metallic flake paint job on this probably the earliest earliest flaked car I guess but very much a wedge type design, not as extreme as the one behind it, but incredible nonetheless. Of course, this is a mid-engine. You can see the engine in the middle there. Even the seats have the same sparkle treatment as the outside of the car. And of course, this was just a design study that never really materialized into anything, but definitely some styling cues came from it. What an amazing room this is. slightly more modern things like the 1996 Nuvola, the Cloud, and this 33-2 Coupe Speciale, 1969. This is a Pininfarina design, has the Quadrifoglio emblem there on the door, mid-engine race car based on the 33. And I just love the idea of, you know, how people did it back in the day. These manufacturers would create a base car and then get different coachwork uh, for the same platform making completely different cars. I mean, people would even buy cars and take them to their coach work of, you know, that they trusted more and just get the car reskinned. It was absolutely incredible. 
I think we should uh, be thinking about doing more of this stuff with modern cars. And then we move on to another very special era of Alfa Romeo, the 30s. I mean, if you had an Alfa Romeo in the 30s, you were the boss. Like this 6C from 1938. Look at the lines of this thing. Massive engine up front, kind of dictating that proportion. Proportions are very much front focus with that coupe rear. And then it kind of progresses on the different models. This is a touring Superleggera 6C2500 Sport from 1939. This is before Ferrari even existed, guys. I mean, think about it. And again, another 6C iteration from the 1950s. Super Leggera body, big, big two-door coupe. And look at the positive camber on the back. <laughs> That's absolutely crazy. And of course, we end up at the best one of the lot. This is the 1938 8C 2900B Lungo. So this is a long wheelbase version of the 8C. It runs a straight eight motor and it is proportion like a Bugatti Atlantique, but it has so much class and so much alphaness into it. It's just literally one of the most beautiful cars ever designed. Again, this is touring Super Leggera coachwork and a true work of art. And right behind it is the 2.3 liter straight eight motor that powers the 8C2300, a true masterpiece. And I just love the idea of straight eights. I have no idea why they got rid of them. So many cars back in the pre-war era used to run eight cylinder straight engines and they sound absolutely super unique. Nothing like a V8, of course, as a firing order. This actually runs a supercharger right there. So we move on to a separate room that has all the Giuliettas. So this is a 1955 prototype and over here, we have the 1600 Duetto, which of course is the one with that tail that kind of flows rearwards and downwards. Coda di Solula, as they call it in Italy. The spider to have. And so we move on to the production Giulietta's, starting with the Sprint from 1954, the Giulietta TI from 57, the Sprint Speciale from 57. This is probably the nicest one of the lot, if you ask me. Around this column, we have the Giulietta SZ, the Coda Tronca. So this is a Zagato design. You can actually see what that means. Coda Tronca means like the tails being cut off kind of thing. This is the Giulia TI Super, uh, the lightweight race version. Call it like an RS, if you will. The TZ, another Zagato rarity. This thing must be insanely valuable today. And then we get to the Giulia's, the Sprint GT from 1963 the GTA, stunning, and the Junior Z, which is actually, strangely enough, one car that I get to see a lot of in Japan. This, along with the TZ, for some reason, uh, really resonates with Japanese collectors and car guys. Again, I think it's because they're really different, rare, and they have that iconic Zakato design from the 70s that really make Japanese guys love these things. Okay, it's a bit loud in this room, but this is where the motorsport era begins for Alfa Romeo. I'll do a quick loop around. These pre-war cars. 1924 on to 1925, 31 Le Mans car. Monza Special from 1931. And the craziest one of them all, absolutely stunning. The 1938 8C 2900 Le Mans edition. Look at that thing. We continue on to the Tipo B GP car from 32 and the Tipo C 12C 
and right behind it, the Quadrifoglio emblem that is still used today. And here from 1931, a twin engine GP car. So it has two transmissions that power the two individual wheels. Yes, it's as bizarre as it sounds, but uh, it only lasted a couple of races. It was a wild idea. Both engines never used to have the same performance. It was a very tricky drive, but uh, crazy that they would have made that in 1931. Absolutely incredible. Another yeah. twin engine. I mean, they, they, they both give power. Oh, they both give power. That's insane. Yeah. Can you? So right. straight eight, straight eight, powering the rear wheels. Six, this is even crazier. But honestly, what I love is that other one, the fact that- They're side by side. Essentially what it, what's happening is, that has become a locked diff car. Yeah. Because it's one engine per wheel. Per wheel, yeah. So then, uh, apparently, you would have to shut one engine down to make a tight turn. Yeah. To, to it was too like tricky, drag a wheel. too tricky to drive. Then they came up with this solution, I guess, but upped it up a notch. That is just ridiculous. So this is a six liter, straight 16. <laughs> So 12 liters of fury here. That's crazy. Like it never fails to amaze me just how much experimentation Alfa Romeo did. So this is a 36, 37 car. Um, and it runs a 1.5 liter flat 12 with twin superchargers. So this is a, a test car, which is kind of like, you know, trying to change uh, technology when it came you know, to actual mechanical layout, uh, engine composition, and the aerodynamics. Unfortunately, this car never actually moved away from this prototype that they came up with. And the project was dropped and they moved on to these very successful Formula One cars. This is actually uh, one of the most successful. Uh, it won 11 out of the 11 races in 1952. And then that progressed for Alfa Romeo until they stopped with F1 to concentrate in the early 50s with the regular production cars like the Julia. Uh, they put all resources to that. And then eventually they came back to motorsport. But for that, we have to go to the other side of the room here. This is the 33 Stradale prototype. One of, one of the most famous Alfa Romeo race cars that ended up kind of being an inspiration to so many other cars that came after it. It is something beyond special to see up close the proportions you can just never understand them when you see it in a picture in a book and that progresses onwards to the rest of the 33 generations started with this Daytona Daytona special race car on to the 33-3 from 1970 and moving on to these insane 12 cylinder racing prototypes this is a Type 33 TT12 from 1975. I always remember seeing these cars in uh, Top Trumps. Yes, I'm a nerd. I used to play with Top Trumps cards back in the day. And I remember these cars with their elevated rearview mirrors. I always wondered why the hell they had to do that. But if you look at how the driver was sitting in the cockpit, that was probably the only way to see behind the rear spoiler. Amazing things. And this is the engine that powered these insane sport prototypes. Oh, so crazy. Flat 12 NA. Mechanical fuel injection, gold cam covers, tiny little clutch. 11,500 RPM and 500 horsepower from a three liter. Okay, so the engine we just looked at here, this flat 12 NA, was the last NA to power these sport prototypes on this car and then they move to the turbo era. This is Alfa Romeo's very first turbo car, as you can see there. And basically it runs an engine based on this. They went down to 2.1 liters. They kept the flat 12 layout and added one turbo on each side. So you can see the mechanical wastegate there and the intercoolers here on the side. 640 horsepower for 650 kilos. These guys are absolutely mad. To drive cars like these. Over here, another very special Julia. This is the TZ Zagato design. And as Larry just pointed out, it's got Ferrari 250 GTO vibes when it comes to the design. And we go over to Alfa Romeo's era of supplying F1 engines, starting with the Brabham and then this test car here from 1981. And then we move on to what is definitely my favorite racing Alfa Romeo, the 1993 155 DTM. This is so sick. And here's the engine. 
2.5 liter V6 NA, 11,500 RPM and 450 horsepower. You can see the injectors in there before the throttle bodies. And of course, like I was saying before, the Giulia was a popular choice for the police, which kind of started off the era of the Carabinieri cars, the dark blue Alpha 75, the Alfetta here, or the Alpha 90 actually, and the Alfetta down here, Alfetta 2 liter Protetta, and even these station wagon Julius in military green. And this is something I never even knew existed. 1954, 1900 Marta. So this is the special side of the Alfa Romeo Museum. This is the stuff that they keep not hidden away. I mean, you can request to come here and check out this kind of stuff here. You can see mock-ups and wind tunnel test cars. But basically this is the spillover from the museum. So whatever cars that, you know, get flown out or taken away from the museum itself, uh, they get filled up with cars from here. And there's some really special stuff here, like, like really interesting, bizarre one-offs and a lot of production cars that uh, we didn't see up there and just pretty much everything that they had from the old museum. here uh, a lot of like you know design studies made out of wood or wax even test seats a bunch of covered up stuff that we don't know what's all about some engines displays and it's really cool to see how you know they've kept all this stuff I mean regular production version 75 1.8 this is exactly the car that my dad had wow absolutely incredible and then really rare stuff like the Deluxe 2600, big, big, luxurious sedan. And then you get to kind of this side here and you see they have the entire layout of the 1975 sport production series. Every track that they hit, the Alfetta, some sorts here. There's the SZ and the RZ. So this is the Zagato Specials uh, and the Roadster version. See a lot of these in Japan. Japanese people love the rare stuff. Over here is a Barchetta version of a spider. Really interesting wheels. Kind of looks like a take on a Watanabe. Center mounted rear view mirror. There's a race 75 back here and a GTA 156 wagon. And as we go through here, really sick GTV with a bonnet bulge. Sprint Veloce Bertone. Crazy, crazy old race cars here. And this kind of like uh, early 2000, kind of like hill climb sport prototype uh, race car. I think it's based on an Ozella 
chassis powered by an Alfa Romeo engine. And then we get to this. This is uh, the Group C basically. That's what it's called here at Alfa Romeo. This is uh, Alfa's ready to go Group C race car, which never actually saw the light of day. Um, powered by Ferrari V12. Uh, the crazy thing is they actually developed a V10 NA engine for this, uh, but they ended up going for the Ferrari V12. The cool thing is though that the V10 ended up going to a very special car that we're gonna see uh, downstairs later. And it's pretty much the car I really wanted to see because I've never seen it before. It's the Alpha 164 uh, prototype that was running that V10. It's a pity that they actually never ended up racing these things. Probably one of the coolest Group C design ever made. Tiny little cockpit, the right hand drive for some reason. All carbon fiber tubbed, featherweight doors. And as Larry just pointed out, it actually kind of looks like a Toyota GT at the front. This is something really cool. So this is the actual prototype version of the Alpha Montreal. You can see it looks visibly very different. It has a much flatter, pointier nose. The headlight, uh, I guess, eyebrows are separated. It's in between one piece. And this is actually based on a Julia with a two liter. So um, that's why on the production car, you see a NACA duct here to give more space to the larger V8 that they ended up running in there. So we almost walked past this, but this is actually a really interesting piece. This is a 1987 hybrid motor based off of Alpha's flat four engine that kind of powered the Alpha Sud and the 33. And it runs an electrical generator at the top connected by a belt onto the flywheel. There's a little tensioner there and then the control unit here. So this could be run either in electric mode, in ice mode only, or as a combination. So proving that Alfa Romeo was really up there with you know engineering ideas and crafting these crazy wild creations but never having the budget necessary to kind of bring it to production. A real pity. On to the next floor. And here we go. This is the second floor where all the crazy prototypes are. Oh my God, the Turbo 75 Evolution. Oh. Oh my God. Do you know it's Miller time? <laughs> oh God, America. <laughs> wow. Oh my Lord. Look at this gold right here. Look at all these one-off prototypes. What on earth is this? And this thing, Alpha van, two-door van. Whoa. But there's one car I'm looking for. One very special 164 I'm looking for. This looks like a Triumph. Look at these things. Caimano, 1971 Ital design. This is insane. It's just the glass. Yeah, this is it. The Pro Car series. Wow. The one that got the V10 from the Group C. So then this runs on everything. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing uh, like a, a TV piece they did on this back in the day as a kid and just being blown away. So, uh, yep, this is it right here. This is easily my favorite car of the entire Alfa Romeo collection, the 164 Pro car. This runs the V10 engine that was made for the Group C car that actually was uh, dropped in favor of the Ferrari V12. And unfortunately, the FIA ended up dropping the Pro car series. It was supposed to be uh, a kind of demo series before F1 races. No other manufacturer took it seriously. So Alfa Romeo went to the trouble of creating this and then the whole idea was dropped and they ended up with this one here, which was made in collaboration with Brabham in the UK, which is why this car is actually right-hand drive. But if you look from the back, you can actually see where the V10 sits, right there behind the front seats. Strangely enough, they have left the rear headrests on the seats and it has pretty much the exact same dimensions as a stock 164. They haven't gone crazy with the aero or over fenders or anything. It's narrow body. It just has a DTM style spoiler back there. And obviously the wheels and the fitment kind of give it away. And the 164 sits next to Nanini's DTM 155. Another legendary car from a legendary series. 
And then this is the Italian Touring Car Championship, the ITC. This is the 155 GTA, which came before the DTM. And it has a very different spoiler setup compared to the DTM car here, which has a lot more aero stuff happening, including a crazy diffuser setup. And those massive exhausts that come out there. And over here we have a ton of mock-ups for designed or wind tunnel use. Cars that may look familiar, like the Mito here, or cars that never even saw the light of day. And among all this awesomeness, there's something we spotted, which kind of blew my mind, because I never knew this, but this is an Alfa Romeo Wanko engine, twin rotor setup, mid-60s prototype engine that was run in a Duetto, never really made it into production. And they have a cutaway here with one of the rotors on display. So there you go. Another perfect example of how Alfa Romeo really pushed the boundaries of engineering. Pretty much coming up with a rotor at the same time as Mazda did with the Cosmo. Okay, as we progress over here, there's one car that I noticed is what I thought was a 4C, but it's actually the Diva. This is a concept car that was made in uh, mid 2000s, so 2004, I believe. And it was kind of kind of design hint at the 33, the 33 Stradale. And it ended up incorporating a lot of styling cues that ended up on the 4C uh, once they decided not to make this. Uh, so it's an interesting looking uh, mid-engine uh, sports car. This actually runs a V6. The 4C ended up having the four-cylinder obviously, but it has interesting styling touches like that kind of Enzo-esque front. Next to it, the TZ, the TZ, Zagato design. Another crazy GTV wide body creation here, the 8C convertible. Scarabeo Alfa Romeo. This is a kind of like a Lotus Europa version <laughs> in Alfa Romeo style. A couple of other interesting vintage cars here from the old days. Strangely enough, there's a Rover here and Stelvio Tonale show car, the 4C. So you can see how it looks very similar to the Diva. A nice progression. And then this the Nürburgring test car. Okay, so Alfa Romeo continues to blow my mind. This is actually an F1 engine from uh, the mid 80s. This was Alfa's attempt at creating something a bit different for its supposed client Ligier. It actually never ended up uh, going to fruition, uh, but they did build this engine. So if you notice, it's a 1.5 liter four cylinder twin turbo. So each exhaust outlets here split and feed one of the turbos across the whole line of uh, cylinders there so the crazy thing is the turbos are exactly the same size and they're controlled by one single wastegate and it is literally the most interesting turbo setup i've seen ever and on the intake side they have a twin injector setup and uh, velocity stacks which obviously lived inside some kind of intake plenum which was fed from the outlet here of the two turbos possibly with an intercooler or a charge cooler in between but yeah absolutely amazing alpha male blowing my mind yet again
And you know, if you take a look around here, including Indy, Alfa Romeo really has participated in pretty much every form of motorsport and created every possible type of engine out there. It's just mind-blowing if you think about it, just how much engineering uh, Alfa Romeo has done over its, you know, 100 plus year history. And it really goes across the board, you know, agricultural stuff. Right after the war, they even did stoves and all the aviation engines that they did pre-war. It's just given uh, an insane amount of experience to a company that um, unfortunately has uh, struggled uh, as it kind of got bought out by Fiat in the, in the kind of dark period of, of the company and then kind of stayed above board with its engineering know-how and creating interesting sporty cars even uh, you know for four-door sedans and interesting stuff like that. The Alfa Sud Caimano. Detail design, creation, one of those wedge. Actually, this is probably the most exaggerated wedge to the point that there is no roof line. It's just a plexiglass cover and it just oozes 70s. So this is the coupe version of the Disco Volante. So we saw the Roadster version downstairs. So these Beautiful things never actually saw the light of day. They were only prototypes made by Carrozzeria Touring Superleggera and possibly one of the most distinct designs that Alfa Romeo ever put out. We'll uh, take a look from the front. So you can see here from the front that unmistakable kind of like line that goes all around creates that floating effect. That's why it was called a disco volante or UFO. And I think the roadster actually emphasizes that design a little bit better than the coupe because with the, with the roof line that high and that rounded, it kind of takes away from the overall shape, but an incredible car nonetheless. Only five were made in total between the roadsters and the coupes. And Alfa Romeo has two of them, uh, one downstairs, the roadster, and this one here. The other ones sort of got lost. All right, so that ends our tour of the Alfa Romeo Museum and this special uh, off public two floors of amazing stuff that we got to see. I have to give a massive thank you to Alfa Romeo. They arranged this visit for us so quick and so short notice. I'm very grateful that they allowed us to come here and just film away and just see incredible cars that I've always dreamt of seeing. <laughs>